Hey everybody, before we get into today's episode, I want to take a minute to introduce our latest service called Crowd Insight by Gadgetflow. It's an awesome tool we made to help you get honest feedback for your upcoming crowdfunding project. Some of the big results we've seen include increased conversion rate, finding out why your project isn't performing well, and getting feedback you need from potential backers. So please head over to gadgetflow.com slash crowd insight to check it out today. You can also find a link in this week's show notes. Now let's get into the episode. Hello world, this is the Gadget Flow Podcast, the show about everything related to products, entrepreneurship, marketing, and crowdfunding. This week, I got to chat with Zach and Thomas of Funded Today, and Funded Today is the largest crowdfunding marketing and consulting company in the world, and they recently came in 27th in the Inc. 5000 of 2018. It's super impressive. We were so excited to get their knowledge of entrepreneurship and crowdfunding and everything that goes into running and scaling a company, so without further ado, do. We're going to jump into this interview with Zach and Thomas of Funded Today. All right, I am here with Zach and Thomas from Funded Today. Guys, how is it going today? Doing great. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us on. Glad to be here, Alex. Thanks. Absolutely. We're super, super excited to have you both on today. And uh, you guys uh, run Funded Today. So, for maybe our audience who may not know who you guys are or what it is you do, maybe you just explain what Funded Today is and, and what you do. Yeah, so we're the largest uh, crowdfunding marketing agency and creative agency. So we do page design, video work for people who are looking at launching a product on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, as well as launch the products and put all the marketing engine behind it. So that includes paid ads, it includes working with press cross collaborations and uh, our email list of a few hundred thousand users that we deploy so anyone's looking to launch a product kind of across the board anything you need for that on Kickstarter or Indiegogo that's what we do awesome. probably the, probably the most exciting thing about us recently is we made the Inc 500 we were number 27 nationwide and number two in Utah and that was pretty cool that's amazing. Congratulations. That's that's a big deal. <laughs> 27 is really high, too. Oh, yeah. We're the largest of all the crowdfunding agencies, marketing or creative or otherwise. I think Agency 2.0 made the list as well, but they were way down there. Wow. So. Well, congratulations. That's awesome. So I'm curious how you guys know each other. How did you uh, you know, start start this together? What's, what's your guys' history? As the cliche goes... It's not what you know, it's who you know, and that's kind of how it worked with Thomas and I. I reached out to Thomas several years ago, probably, I don't know, five, six, seven years, maybe, yeah, six and a half years ago, and I had just asked him about a testimonial that he gave on a product that I was looking to buy. His name popped up, and it said he lived in Utah, and I said, who's this Thomas Alvin in Utah? So I found him on Facebook, I believe, added him on Skype, and over the years, we would just talk and chat about business and all kinds of things, and ultimately, we that network led to us starting a business together. <laughs> nice. Nice. So I'm, I'm really curious what, uh, you know, and I like on this podcast to kind of ask like crowdfunding is interesting and I'm always curious about how it, it becomes the thing that uh, our guests want to pursue. So what was the thing for you guys, maybe in those conversations, those Skypes, like what, what about crowdfunding really stuck out to you as the, the thing you wanted to pursue and become experts at? And that's the funny story. We never even planned on doing this. It literally was just a side project, a side thing where Zach and I came together on the first on the first campaign. And after that, we were going to part ways and I was going to go back to my political consulting and marketing. And Zach was going to go back to his company where he helped startups and, and new businesses getting off the ground. But after our first campaign, somebody else hit us up and said, hey, we saw what you did on this campaign. We need to raise $100,000 more in 100 hours called the Free Waves earphones. Mm. And they had a goal of 300000 and had only raised 170000 So really, it was like $130,000 in less than a week. And we did some tests, and it looked like it was going to work or not work, and we weren't sure. And we, were, we, we literally... If it wasn't for them, there might not be funded today because we both made the money we did on the first campaigns and kind of parted. We're going to part ways. 
And it was just people asking us again and again, will you do this for us? That finally six months, a year in, we realized, oh, you know what? We're going to make this our primary focus. So that's how it started. We never planned to, to, to create this. So in a way, it was the market asking us for the product. So we literally had a product market fit. It wasn't something we created thinking this is what people like. People asked us for it again and again. So it just kind of happened. Right. That's a really cool story. I mean, and, and there's no better way to validate what you're doing than when you're like, uh, you're not even trying and you keep getting business. That's incredible. Exactly. So it shows that you guys are good at what you do. So, I mean, maybe now, I mean, okay. So zooming, you know, fast forward a little bit, you guys have a huge team that uh, you're, you're working remote all over the world. So maybe like, can you just explain how big is the team now? How many, how many teammates do you have? We have about six, something people working for us now wow that's that's incredible I, wish I, I should i should i should know the exact number huh <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean it's 60 even i mean that's just a lot that's incredible guys um so i mean what has that been like what has that transition been like from going from you know the two of you uh making things happen and then somehow you know growing and scaling to that kind of uh, the size you know maybe maybe tell me one of the challenges you guys have faced in that process and how you overcame it I think, yeah. we're di I think we're different than a lot of people who are business owners in the sense that Thomas and I don't necessarily have to do anything in our business anymore, which is a good and bad thing. It's good because that's the dream, right? Freedom, residual income, everybody doing things better than you used to be able to do. Mm -hmm. I guess the bad part is that you kind of see your baby getting taken care of by all these other people and <laughs> you, you don't yeah. necessarily have control of it anymore. So. It's a double-edged sword for sure, but it's allowed Thomas and I a lot of opportunities to do a lot of different things. We've got a we got a podcast now that's coming out here next few weeks. We're writing a book. We've got a lot of different extracurricular things that we do, both business, private, charitable. So it, it's been good in that sense that it's allowed us to really do whatever we want with our lives. I mean, we're we're living the American dream essentially, you could say. Yeah. But it, it's it's sad in the sense that. Here is something that Thomas and I literally started and understood every single process and every little nuance of our business and ran, you know, hundreds of campaigns before we got to a point where we were successfully outsourced completely from our business. So there's there's a pain to letting go as well. I mean, I sure. think every business owner needs to learn to let go if they ever want to truly have something that's different than a job. Otherwise, I think you're just working for yourself and you're working 80-hour weeks instead of 40-hour weeks. <laughs> right. So, there, totally. there's, something, there's something to be said about that, but in, Absolutely. In, in, in the end, I think we're we're pretty happy with how things turned out. Fund of the day is definitely a success story that I personally never could have realized. Thomas has a pretty big vision. Maybe he thought it was going to be as big and successful as it became, but for me, it definitely exceeded all my expectations, and now I'm at a point where I'm like, okay, well, what next? I've never thought we'd get this big. How do we go bigger, or do we want to go bigger, or do we maintain market share? Or, and that's kind of where we're at now. What What do we do, or where do we want to go? Yeah. Sure, sure. So maybe, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I hear that totally. And it's funny you say that because I, I can only imagine you guys put your, you know, your heart and soul into something for so long and, and to see it grow and become successful and then and then to really let it go. You know, that's something we haven't really covered on the show before. That's, but I imagine that's a lot harder than it sounds um, just talking about it, you know, because you put so much into something. It has to be difficult. I mean, I know you guys are obviously still running everything and, and overseeing uh -huh. everything, but, you know, the day to day stuff that you, you push forward for so long, working so hard, it has to be challenging. Um, but I, I, I'm curious, like the process, maybe, maybe, uh, you know, like maybe give me a lesson you guys learned in scaling like that, like scaling your organization to that kind of size. Um, maybe when you were at from, you know, employee number five to like 30, that range, like what, what is that process like for you guys? For me, interestingly enough, getting the first five is the hardest part. Getting new people is actually so easy and nice now because everybody just fits right in. We have the right managers. We have the right people. Our system is, yeah, pretty, we, pretty brilliant now so yeah, it's we, actually created, easy to add new people we've created a system i think is part yeah. of it when we hire somebody we do things on the fly we know what we're doing we innovate but as you're building something you need to create a system and structure because not everyone you're bringing on are entrepreneurs like yourself mm -hmm. right and they want to literally be told what to do not like in a in a bossed around way but in a structured way otherwise they feel lost and i understand this right because i yeah 
Zach and I are running this company. We make the decisions. And I remember just about eight years ago, I was with another company uh, that my brothers had started. And in a way where you're not the final decision maker, you have to kind of have some deference, right? And hey, is this how you want it? You want it like this? But when you're the decision maker, you make those decisions. So as we brought people on and hired people, again, you have to create a system, right? Mm. And a lot of it, we're building new divisions or doing new things. So there's not a lot of structure or, hey, here's how, like, really, I think our, our most painful growing experience was how we handle situations that weren't anticipated in terms of compensation. Because mm. 90% of the people at Funded Today are all commission-based. So our salespeople, our PR people, our paid, our uh, paid media people, uh, they're all our, our video division, our page design division. They're all we, we structured it that way because we wanted everybody to focus strictly on our clients. We knew that if we paid our people really well, but we only paid them really well if they do well for our clients, it would just create this beautiful business that became Funded Today. And it worked out, worked out great. But like Thomas said, because of that structure, there's a lot of competition. And sometimes it's hard to keep the camaraderie up among all the different divisions well, that Funded Today. And, and everybody will compete internally. But then unanticipated situations come up. And because they've never been anticipated or never been discussed before, then you run into issues where you have to talk it over with the team and a lot of times they're like, well, I thought it was this way. Well, it's this way. Well, what, what are we going to do? And then you run into all kinds of perspective issues where it's he said, she said, or what was said, and how do you address that, and what do we do from here, right, Thomas? Right. Yeah, exactly. For example, hey, you're, hey, sales team or marketing team, you're going to get X percent of the sale or X percent of what your marketing raise is. Well, then what happens if the client doesn't pay? Do they get mm -hmm. paid or do they not get paid? Well, what if it's a huge client? What if we've lost $50,000 on ads because the client isn't paying us? Hmm. Do we just take the hit? Do they take the hit? Okay, well, what if we? What if they don't get paid because we're not getting paid, but then what if they later do pay us? Right. Then how much? Well, what if they only pay us a percentage, right? Those are things we had never anticipated. Wow, yeah. So we structured contracts and then things arose and it's like, oh man, we should have thought of well again you can't think of those things you don't know what's going to happen right but those are things you have to be flexible and i think in our experience uh with some growing pains i think you want to defer to the contractor to the employee give them the benefit and say hey moving forward here's how we're going to do it yeah. right every t every time we've every time we've uh, said well this happened and we're going to do this they're like no <laughs> but every time we've said this happened and that's okay we're still going to do this, but going forward, we're going to do, do this. We've had a lot better, a lot better uh, feedback sure. from our people. Yeah. And I think the easiest thing that we've done to clean things up in the future is because everything in our business is completely digital, essentially. I mean, we don't really have offices. We have people all over the world. Most of our people in the United States, and I'd say maybe 50% are even in Utah, but still we have people all over the place. So what we've done, and we learned this really just in the last few years, and it's funny, like I am a serial entrepreneur. I've never had a normal job my whole life but the more i've become a serial entrepreneur the more i've fallen into bureaucracy <laughs> and <laughs> right it, it's funny i say that because you would never think i'm the one that likes systems and processes and all this stuff but i've actually fallen in love with all that stuff and i see why these big companies have all the stuff that they have it's just necessary so what we've done bureaucratically speaking is anytime something substantial gets changed we send a, we send a memo out and it's it. it's just a really nice memo with the goes to our client specialist we would call it dsm9 client specialist memo 9 and we'd send it out and it would go out to all our client specialists and it would clarify something and then from that point forward we've said memo uh, memos dictate law memos dictate policy changes and people understand that that way we can have conversations on skype or email or text or phone but that those are just conversations yeah, yeah. And let me let me share one other thing too uh, actually two ideas about this right and it's a great question most people usually don't ask us about this, but one principle everyone should always remember, your greatest enemies always come internally. Yep. And that is because they know the inner workings inside and out. And yeah, it, it, it applies to like everything, right? Like divorce, like if someone gets divorced, like your greatest enemy often, I see these people who get divorced and it's like, 
you know, just head to head, so much friction and emotion, right? But with business, if you look at so many people in the business world, like Walt, um, Amazon Jet and Jet.com, Jet. right? Jet.com was founded by former Amazon uh, employee executive, right? And, right? and I could go on and on with so Tinder many companies. Tinder and like, Bumble if you're in the dating world. <laughs> yes. There, there's so many. And so we had issues where one of our first hires went and took our assets and started competing. We, we recently resolved that and had a settlement and won and everything. But basically, I, I, I know other, so again, just so many companies where that happens and it's often the first hire. And I think it's, it in part has to do with the first hire feels like they work hard for you. They often know all of the inner workings and they often know what your profit margin is, your net profit and how much you're making. And they're like, why am I doing this? I see how I can run everything. And any business at its core is super easy if you know how to do everything. Anything is easy if you know how to do it. And so when you have those first hires where you're not compartmentalized and you don't have divisions and you have one person who sees the whole process, it's so easy. So do two things. You got to make sure you treat them well, make sure they're valued and be careful who you hire and mm. protect those assets. And again, you don't expect it's going to happen, but invariably it seems to happen so, so frequently. Right, so right, right. That would be another tidbit of advice when you're expanding and growing outside of just yourself. Totally. I think that's so, so cool to hear you guys talk about too. Cause that's something I haven't, um, we haven't really heard much of on the show is, is that challenge of growth and like the, the human side of growth. You know, oftentimes I just hear like the really, uh, great parts of it, <laughs> but those are very real challenges that come with just working with other people. You know what I mean? And so I, I appreciate you guys talking about that. And I think it's really wise, uh, advice as well. Um, when it comes to growing and scaling, like you have to think about that stuff and you also have to be ready for all those things that are going to come up that yeah. you don't, you're not expecting. Like you said, it's, uh, what, what part of any of that could you guys have planned for? Um, not much unless someone, had I, think it's, I think it's important to, yeah. And I think it's important, Alex too, to note that as much as I don't like legal stuff, you need to get really legal. If there are issues that come up, mm. make sure all of your people are signing contracts enforce non-competes we've been fortunate enough to win every single lawsuit that we've ever sued in and we it's not like we sue all the time but we need to protect our trademark we have competitors that go and use the name funded today because we're the biggest agency in the world and our name's popular all over the place so they'll put their name in our ad or they'll put their name on our website and you know like get funded today with agency 2.0 or whoever else you know people will say things like that and you can't do that. And I think it's important to protect yourself as much as possible. And again, this is, this is a different Zach talking here. If you talked to me five or six years ago, I would be like, just go for it. Fell fast, break things, you know, the whole Facebook model, but even Mark Zuckerberg's learned that he needs to change his tone there as well. And I think I'm the same way. Mm. You need to be more methodical. You need to be more systematic. You need to be more process oriented. You need to clean things up as much as possible along the way, because ultimately if you don't, those things are going to come back to hurt you. And the more prior pr planning that you have in place, the less likely those problems will be issues for you long term. And that's what happened with us. We had so many good things in place because of all the businesses that Thomas and I had ran before funded today that when we did run into issues with people competing with us or having to fire people or different things like that, it while it took while it took years to resolve, we were able to win them all because we had all of the right processes and things in place to protect our assets and to pre protect ourselves long term. Yeah. yeah. No, that's that's great advice, guys. So I kinda wanna shift let me, let me Oh, you want to? Could I share, share one more thought, which I thought sure. was so beautiful? And this would be for companies that are larger. Uh, I was once asked on, a, on another podcast where I like to learn and where I get, you know, my information, my learning from. And, and I, I like to buy a lot of books, but for me, I love Forbes. Zach knows I love Forbes. Whenever we, we fly, I always have my Forbes magazine with me. <laughs> but <laughs> he put a, a funny story, he always puts it in the. The seat, the seat compartment and then i used to be like what the heck why does every time i fly with you there's a there's a forbes magazine <laughs> in the, but it's always him and he, he does it as a joke now so he always puts a bunch of four magazines in all the seat cushions of the oh, that's awesome <laughs> but, so this most recent edition and forbes is not paying me to say this of course but um there was an article on jeff bezos right and, and that's why i love these articles because it shows some of the brightest minds and what they're doing 
now, like right now, right in our day, mm-hmm. and they were talking about scale, and he shares that in his right that's so big that they have um, I don't know if they call it a yes policy. Somebody could pick up the latest edition, um, but basically how he says we want to be a yes. Like like a not a yes man I forget the exact phrase but but say yes to like everything right so if there's somebody at Amazon who has an idea that they can go to their boss but if it's not their boss they could go to somebody else or go to their boss's boss and get approval right so that way if there's a good idea that if their boss doesn't like it you know traditionally it's like okay somebody has an idea their boss needs to approve it their boss's boss and then maybe some committee and then it can see the light of day right so there's so many places where it can just get shut down. But the idea is if it's something new, if it's something innovative horizontally within what they're currently doing, right, some improvement, some new efficiency, whatever, that's like, yes, let's go test it out. And and you can find some director or some boss that would give you that authorization to go do it. So you have that leeway, right? They want to make it really easy to go, go do new things. And so they try to spur innovation and allow their company to continue to grow, right? So it's not coming top down, it can come organically within the company. So that's actually what they do horizontally, but then vertically, right? If it's a new industry, if it's a new niche, if it's something where they're expanding horizontally, then um, I, what did Jeff Bezos said? He, he says he he's the slow things down executive. Mm. And basically they look at it and they say, um, you know, how scalable is this? How big is this market? Well, well, the first thing they said, is this a me too offering? If it's a me too offering, we're not even going to look at it. We're not even going to touch it. We don't want to be a me too. We want to create things that are innovative. Mm. Right. And then, and then the second thing is, uh, how scalable is this? Right. You know, if, if they're only going to be making, you know, 10 million a year from it, it's, it's not worth their time. Right. Cause they're doing billions of dollars. Right. Um, and the third point is a few days ago, I read, I can't remember the third point, but, but it's in, interesting right depending on the size of a company your your culture and your 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 process is going to be different and recently I, w- I was talking to a consultant and he was saying what has been your process for your strategy for deciding how you grow or not grow and really we don't have one and I think a startup usually isn't going to have one you're kind of dabbling in different things hey does this work no does this work no because you don't really have a benchmark to say hey the market needs to be the size or or things like that for it to make sense for us to put our resources into it. You're kind of just dabbling around. But then as you start growing, you need to make more strategic decisions, right? If there's something that Zach and I could do that would make us an extra $50,000 a year, right, for the company, we, we'd probably look at it and say, no, we're not going to do that. But for somebody who's just starting up and they're getting on, you know, just getting on their feet, that might make sense, right? So again, well, it's funny everyone- you mentioned that because Jeff Bezos has a policy at Amazon. And we've learned this from some of the top executives at Amazon that we've had a chance to work with because of some of the Amazon marketing that we do nowadays and because of some of the connections that we have, we've learned that if they don't, they do not start a new business unless it has $1 billion potential. So like Thomas said, for us, if it's 50,000 bucks, that's a great amount of money for a small business. And some people could live off that. But for us, we would say, well, that's only got the potential to do 50,000. We're not going to do it. Right. Now, maybe, maybe if it was $500,000 a year, we, that's probably our number now. If this could make us $500,000 more a year, then we would look into doing it. And I think it's important to realize those changes come in shifts. You might start mm-hmm. out, what can I do to do $10,000, then $50,000, then 100000 and then your number becomes a million, and then one day you're Amazon, and the number becomes a billion. You have to, you <laughs> right. have to make decisions like that. Otherwise, you can't grow. And I see why Amazon thinks they have stockholders and shareholders to please and other things like that. And if they're doing something that's going to add a million dollars a year, we would think, yeah, that's amazing. For them, that's a rounding error. So Right. Absolutely. That's that's really, really insightful, guys. That's cool. So I, I know I don't want to take too much more of your time, but I do want to maybe um, I maybe ask like two more questions. And the first would be, can you guys give me maybe one success story, maybe one campaign that really stands out to you guys as like the turning point? Maybe one of those that you picked up while you were still, you know, you were, you hadn't even decided to go full time into this, but maybe, maybe the, that moment that was pivotal that you guys decided, wow, this could really be a huge business and we should go all in on funded today. Can you guys, do you have a, an example? you could share yeah i i would say it, it our first campaign was a wallet that zach was consulting with and he brought me on we ran ads and parted ways and that was our first campaign 
But I think it was really, for me, our next two campaigns, our second and third campaign. I believe it was our third campaign. But the second campaign I already talked about where we raised another $100,000 in right. under, under 100 hours. And it was like, wow, we just have a, tw we now have a $20,000 invoice for five days of work. Like this was incredible, right? And mm -hmm. even then at, at that point, it was like, man, this is, this is interesting. We, we didn't know if we could repeat it, right? Like, was it just kind of a fluke? Was it different? But then we were working on, it was actually another wallet called the basics wallet. And I think it was a $60,000 invoice. And I remember talking to Zach and it's like, man, that was like $60,000. Do you think we could do this like again and again? Or do you think we could scale this? So we're doing this times 10. And I, I, one other campaign I, I'd also mentioned is actually free waves because this was happening in around October of 2014. And I remember thinking, man, wouldn't that be crazy to have a million dollar campaign? Hmm. And just two months later, we had our first million dollar campaign, which was, which was, um, I'm drawing a blank here. You have to help me, Zach. I don't know why. Was I'm it Trunkster? Trunkster, yeah. Trunkster, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we had a, you know, now we have, I don't know, like fifty million dollar campaigns we've worked on, right? So it's just, hey, we had another million dollar campaign. Well, it was uh, let's let's have a million dollar month and let's try to have a million dollar day. And <laughs> I think yeah, we've hit all those. Was, but I think when we had those campaigns, where it's like, man, here's a process we weren't even planning to create. It, it just kind of happened, and we realized, man, we're onto something. And it's kind of funny because Zach and I were both like, hey, do we work with each other? Because I'm because I was the marketing person. So I'm like, I don't need Zach. And Zach's like, well, I have these business connections. I could just do this. I don't need Thomas. But, you know, we work together and, and you know, it's worked out. There's I mean, something to be said about partnerships, too. I don't recommend a partnership with more than three people. Two's two's been amazing, really, for the most part. I mean, sometimes maybe it would be good to have one more person. But I, I see a lot of these businesses and they're like, I got six or seven partners. And it's like. It's crazy. Yeah. Man, I don't understand how you guys are y'all gonna make ten grand a year or are you gonna grow <laughs> this or it, it, it can work. Don't get me wrong. Again, it's probably me not making my mindset big enough to see how all these partners come into play. But what we found and we've worked with I think nearly three thousand businesses now, all those that have these seven, eight, nine, ten, even five, six, seven founders, they just don't seem to do well. Eventually yeah. eventually they team up against each other. It's three against two, it's four against three, it's six against four and they fight and they say, well, he's not doing this and he's not doing that with Thomas and I, it's kind of the buck stops here. I got to do my job and Thomas has to do his job. And sometimes we pick up the slack for the other. And most of the time it works out. Okay. Yeah. And it's important to do that. And it's important to trust your partner too. I've had a lot of bad partnerships and really a few good ones. And that's kind of how it is. And fortunately this one's been really good and others have been bad or they've been good and they turn bad. So I would give one bit of advice to anybody listening to this who's starting a business. Go into the business with a long-term mindset. When you make a million bucks in a day, don't take the money out and split it 500,000 500, and balance or, or raid the checking account or whatever. I've seen this happen. With, I'm telling you this because a lot of people are like, yeah, we did it. We got a million bucks or even 100,000 or whatever it is. Don't think like that. If Thomas and I would have thought like that, we would have lost out on the tens of millions that we've made and made a few million and been done. And I've seen my other businesses sabotage that way with other business partners that thought like that because that you work so hard and you make no money and it might be a year or two years and suddenly you're rich or whatever, you know, and you're like, mm -hmm. I've got all this money. And then you just kill a good thing. Right. And it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to do that. And Thomas and I have been smart in that sense that we fully capitalized our business and we could have this thing run for 10 years probably without ever earning another dollar, you know? Right. I, I would, I, I'm curious to hear you guys, maybe this can probably be the last question, but I want to hear what you guys have to say about um, maybe choosing a good partner. Um, I know you're, you're talking about how important it is to find a, a good partner and, and cultivate that relationship. But I also am curious, how, how can you make that a reality? Like what's something you should look for? I can speak to this point pretty good and then I'll let Thomas go. The easiest thing for me is you want to find someone different than you. If mm. you get two people thinking the same, it's a problem. But you also don't want someone to be way too different. I've had partners in the past that are different than me in the sense that maybe one is a good coder and I'm a good marketer, salesperson. That, that, that's okay. But I think what has worked out really well with Thomas and I is we see eye to eye on the marketing and sales side of things for the most part. 
But Thomas is a visionary. He's kind of, I mean, just picture like a Steve Jobs. And I'm more of a systems Okay, Thomas, you got this big vision. Now, how the frick do we make it happen? Kind of guy. That's that's <laughs> yeah. the easiest kind of that's the easiest kind of thing. And I'll set him straight. And sometimes he'll be like, Zach, shut up, man. You got to have a vision. We got to get bigger. We got to grow. We got to do this. Right. And then he'll he'll sell me on his point, and we'll yell and argue and scream even sometimes. But it's fine because we realize that the other is balancing the other out. I mean, like Thomas said, we wouldn't have started Fund of the Day if it weren't for that first time when I reached out to Thomas and said, "Try this out." And then the second time when Thomas decided to basically take his dad's credit card and put a hundred thousand dollars on it over a hundred hours and raise a bunch of money for a campaign, like that's the visionary in him and me is like, just give me like four thousand bucks for the referral fee and we'll call it good. Yeah, we did. We did share that story. Like literally, the client was only going to pay us if we hit the goal. So there was a big risk we wouldn't, and all of that credit card debt would be on us. And at that time, I was doing political stuff, and I had a client. Political clients are funny to work with. And I ended up getting paid, but at the time I had like $50,000, $45,000 in debt on my dad's credit card. And Zach didn't want to take the plunge, even though he was in a financially sound position to do so. So I was the one who took that risk, right? So that's, that's kind of me. We balance each other out. Wow. But, but in terms of what I would say, first, I would say choose a partner who had, who's been successful or is, looks like they're going to be successful, right? I, 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 I looking back, I, I put some money in some other ventures where it's people who like have struggled their whole life, right? And mm -hmm. they don't have any like skill set they're bringing to the table. It's like just the idea. Well, ready for this? Ready for this? Going to be the manager and never partner, never partner with someone just because they have the idea or they're going to be the manager. They need some skills where they're actually going to be driving the business forward. Otherwise, otherwise it's like straight up dead weight. So and why and why start a business right off the bat? Thomas and I ran 10, 11 campaigns, maybe. I don't, it might have even been more. We were like literally testing each other out. And like Thomas shared, why do I need Zach? Like he shared with me, why do I need Thomas? Those thought of our mind a bunch of times mm. until we realized we've got some synergy here. We didn't start a business. We made probably a million bucks before we went back and backdated everything and turned wow. it into an LLC. That's so cool. That's such yeah, a, good, share, a unique way. I'll, I'll share one other. I, I always say that. I have so many people come to me, and, and sorry to cut you off, Thomas, but I have so many people come to me and they say, Zach, come on, man. I got this amazing idea. Sign this NDA. Do this, do that. I'm like, come on, man. Let's just figure it out. Let's, let's launch this thing. Let's see what happens. Let, let's get going. Let's make some money, and we can always figure some stuff out in the end. And maybe I'm wrong there, you know, like, well, you got to get a pet and you got to do this. I just feel like I'm not wrong. I feel like if you, want, if you want to test somebody out, if you want to try something out, there is never a rush to formalize it all and make it all legal. You can clean it up a month later, a, a, three months later, even a year later. Yeah. If, if things seem like they make sense, like test the waters. You're about to marry somebody for life sometimes. Mm -hmm. Thomas and I have been doing this for 10 years and it looks like it'll go for five more, you know? Yeah, and, and so, one last thing. One last thing, which, which is interesting, right? In terms of choosing a partner, what's more important than choosing a partner is actually choosing the right product market fit. Mm. Uh, Zach and I, on, a, on one of our podcasts that will be going live soon on the Funded Today podcast, we, we talked about this, how the research shows, and Anderson Horowitz, uh, the VC firm, you know, Mark Anderson behind it, he, well, Mark. Mark Andreessen. Was, uh, Andreessen. Yep. Andreessen, sorry. I always, I always mispronounce his name. Andreessen, thank you, Zach. Um, he gave a presentation at Stanford, and he said, what's more important, the team, the product, or what was the other one? The, the market. market. Yeah, the, the market. market. And he said, the market, hands down, and, and we knew this, and, and the podcast goes over a whole bunch of stuff, but basically, mm -hmm. it's the market that matters more. You could have the most amazing team, but guess what? If there's there's no market for your idea, for your product, for your service. No one's going to buy it. So who cares what the team is? Right? You're going to get the you're going to get the exceptions to the rule, but by and large, market trumps all. It doesn't. Everybody spends so much time like we got the best team, we got all this talent, we recruited from the Ivy Leagues, we did this, we did that. Give me the worst team ever and the best market ever, and I'll make more money than the best team ever, hundred percent mm. of the time. Wow. 
That's that's so so good, guys. Well, I think that kind of wraps it up for today. But I mean, uh, do you guys have any maybe closing closing thoughts, like a quick thought for maybe someone who's considering starting a campaign, or maybe um, how people can get started working with Funded Today? How, like, how, what would you guys suggest? Yeah, so Zach could share getting, getting started with Funded Today. Here, here's my thought: you should be faster at launching your product, and you should also be slower. It's kind of a, a paradox. You should be faster in pursuing it, right? If you have an idea, man, don't just let it keep sitting there and sitting there and you do nothing. And 10 years later, I got this idea I'm going to do. You know what? You're never going to. So if you're going to do it, just start doing it right now, right? But then also, don't just jump into it. I, I like to say, come up with 10 ideas first. Talk with others. See what their response is. And also, as you're building it, get people to say, hey, if you build this, I'll back it when you launch on Kickstarter. If you do those type of things, then you're going to be more successful. But you, you got to pursue your idea or stop thinking about an idea. That, mm. That's what I would say. Love it. And that, and that goes hand in hand with where I want to go. <clears throat> we talk about this all the time. Fell fast. People get so sad when their idea dies. And I'm happy because now you can figure out another one. You have to sometimes go through five or six ideas. I mean, like Thomas said, I was pretty financially well off before Funded Today because of some other businesses that had succeeded, but Funded Today ended up becoming more successful than them all. If I wouldn't have pivoted and moved on to other businesses, my situation was really unique. I was already in some pretty good businesses, making good money, but I basically got rid of them all over the years as I became more and more invested into Funded Today because Funded Today prevent, presented such a greater opportunity. And it's like Thomas said, I went in it fast. We went and figured it out really quickly. And we found that it could make money, but then we went in it slow in the sense that we didn't get all diehard and gung ho and quit everything we were doing before we made sure that this was actually not just yeah. some crazy fluke, you know? Right. So, so I would give that advice. And then managerial, ma managerially speaking, I'd give this advice. And I say this all the time. Our, our people at Funded Today probably hate me, but I say it so much. And I'm going to say it one more time to everybody here. Perspective is a private experience. I see this so many times. We have seven or eight different visions of Funded Today now for all the different things yeah, that we, we do. Whether we just had this happen today. Oh, geez, yeah. I mean, Thomas saw it firsthand, and I think in the end, I, I resolved it pretty well, right? I believe I mean, so. No, I thought you resolved it really well. Yeah, everybody was happy. So I'll just tell the story. That's the best way to describe it. So we have a lot of work coming in for creative now. Pretty much, I'd say 50% of our work are people who are hiring us to do their videos and their page designs and all the stuff getting ready to launch a new idea, which mm. is great. It's amazing, right? But everybody's getting mad at Funded Today. The salespeople are like, we need to get it done quicker. And the, the page designers and our specialists and our videographers and our pretty much everybody, our sound guys, our editing guys, our mixers, our masters, everybody's like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Slow it down. <laughs> yeah. And it's a great problem to have. And ultimately, I help them see each other's perspectives. Look, guys, these guys, the salespeople are not mad at you. They're mad at the process. So well, let's talk to them about the process and what time we do here. And can you understand why the salespeople are frustrated? And salespeople, can you guys see what's going on here? These guys aren't complaining about sending them tons of work. That's great. They're happy. They, they love it. They're, they're complaining because they want to make sure the quality remains the funded today way so that it's amazing so that we can continue to raise millions of dollars for all these clients. Mm. And it's crazy, right? You would think this wouldn't be a problem, but it was a problem that ultimately was getting into some shouting earlier on our management call mm. today. And in the end, everybody was able, I, I even said that, I'm like, guys, perspective is a private experience. Let's see if we can understand where the creative team's coming from. Let's see if we can understand where the sales division's coming from. And let's see if there's some kind of happy medium. And mm. in the end, we set some rules. We said, okay, any new creative work that comes in, we're going to guarantee a 30-day turnaround. Before we were guaranteeing a 14-day, but because of how much work we have now, if someone were to hire us today, we would guarantee we could launch them by the 28th of October. Mm. And that made the salespeople happy because now they have a timeline. Now the creative people understand that they've got 30 days to get things done so they can still provide great quality, but they don't feel rushed and stressed out by the sales team always yelling at them to get hitting deadlines that are unmanageable and unreachable based upon our current workload. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's just, we see this all the time. And, and usually what, what gets people to stop yelling and screaming is, hey guys, perspective is a private experience. What this person feels is real. What this division feels is real. What's actually real is probably somewhere in the middle. Let's see if we can figure that out real quick. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, guys, I, I appreciate you both so much for being on. I love, I mean, you gave us a ton of insight into what it's like to run and scale and deal with people while running a huge organization or a company. And so I just appreciate both of your time so much. Yeah, I mean, and this was a, this was a different podcast, Alex. I appreciate it. a lot of different questions asked and it was fun to talk about some things we don't normally talk about. So yeah, thanks for having you're, us on. You're, you're great at running a podcast. So thanks to you. <laughs> awesome guys. Well, uh, we look forward to, uh, you know, sharing the episode with our audience and everyone make sure to go check out funded today and everything they're up to guys. Thank you so much for being on this week. Thanks again. Okay, we'll see you. That was my interview with Zach and Thomas of Funded Today, so please make sure to check out everything they're doing at Funded Today and connect with them to get help with your next campaign. Thank you so much for being on today, guys. This podcast is made by GadgetFlow, and we're proud to be the number one platform to find new and awesome gadgets. So make sure to check out our site for all the new products we're curating every single day. We'll be back next week with another new episode, so in the meantime, please head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating and review. Until next time, thank you so much for listening to the GadgetFlow podcast.